Namrata is not yet joined, is it? She'll be joining. Sure. Gita has joined. Kuresh has not joined. Yeah, I think it's seven. We can. Yeah. Good evening, friends. It's a pleasure to connect uh, after a long time. We've been lying low for some time now due to the pandemic. Let us um, reiterate not to let our guards down till we are safely on the other side of the pandemic. And with that in mind, uh, Keracon 2021, dear friends, will be a virtual meeting, though earlier we had decided to have a physical meeting in the best interest of all concerned. We will soon make announcements regarding submissions and the program details, and we look forward to a very interesting and interactive Keracon 2021 this year too. Meanwhile, beneath the apparently calm waters, Konya Society of India has been striving uh, to enrich its academic endeavors. The Society Journal is soon to be launched, and I request our members to get ready with scientific material for publication. The first issue is being planned to be released early next year, and details will soon be announced in Cornet regarding the submission process. Coming back to Kera Connect, a meeting for the members of the society by the members of the society. Please do suggest topics that you wish to have Kera Connects on. Anyone who has a specific interest in any particular subject and wishes to be a part of the moderating team in the future, please reach out to us and the society office. We would be more than happy to have you all on board. Well, today's DSEC Surgeonar promises to be engrossing. I shall not stand anymore between the program and you. And I hand over the session deliberations to our moderators for the day, Ramya Ravindran and Devyani Gadre. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So good evening, everybody. We are very excited to bring you yet another clinically relevant Kera Connect session. This one is going to focus on the practical aspects of the step-by-step -step approach to mastering decimal stripping endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, we are delighted to have a panel uh, of masters amongst us. And uh, to start off, uh, we have Dr. Samar Basak, the master of EK from the East. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Also on the panel is Dr. Namrata Sharma, uh, who is not just the master of corneal surgeries, but she's also a multitasker beyond compare. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Uh, also on the panel is... Uh, the guru of lamellar keratoplasty for many of us corneal surgeons in India and not only in India, but even abroad, Dr. Rajesh Kogla. Thank you for mentoring this session, sir. And uh, we have with us also Dr. Bhaskar Srinivasan. Uh, sir is a teacher at heart and uh, he's a surgeon as diverse as, uh, sorry, he does surgeries as diverse as keratoprosthesis to cutting edge endothelial keratoplasties. It's always uh, a lot of fun to learn from all of you. Um, we start, start this session with Ramya. Yes, sorry. We start this session with uh, Dr. Samar Basak. He has graciously agreed to teach us step-by-step -step approach to manual dissection of the graph, which was uh, a, a subject of many of the questions that came today with the uh, completion of the surgery with the needle push-in technique. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, 
okay i am uh, sharing my screen and thank you very much rama for and sir. all the uh, introductory notes about gita I have told everything i am sharing my slides and are you okay now yes, yes sir. we can see your screen yes ah, so this is uh, uh, close to my heart manual uh, dissect and uh, i'll be discussing like manual donor preparation first and then i will discuss little bit of theory and then i'll show a full video from start to finish of a recently doing my I mean 3 days back i have done it so i'll show that video and i will conclude that so for the dissection first step is know your tissue that means what that means know about the storage media like 48 hours mk medium preserved cornea is usually more than 50 micron thicker than the chondroitin sulfate containing preserved media i had done this analysis long time back second point is give adequate time for thawing before mounting it on the artificial anterior chamber check for the scleral rim and tissue should be free from conge and iris tissue these are few basics before starting the thing second point is right blade for initial incision so there are many fixed depth blade like steel or diamond it may be 400 450 or 500 micron depth like mk medium preserved tissue i prefer to give my first incision with 450 or 500 micron thick and then for cornisol optisol life for you also all are like better quality media where actually i give 400 micron depth first incision i'll show you in video and right choice of site for proper maneuver of the dissector like we are using two dissectors one is crescent knife another is manual dissector so to me automated dissection is a open discussion uh, dissection more or less it is front surface parallel but the manual dissection is always a closed dissection if you see the here it is ending but it opens in one side and it is more or less back surface parallel third point is right plane for orientation of the artificial anterior chamber so this is the artificial anterior chamber i am very much uh, i mean i am obsessed with this uh, artificial anterior chamber though there is no financial interest there are many parts of it like this is the tissue pedestal this is tissue retainer this is locking ring then there are this is regular crescent blade and this is my own designed lamellar dissector so you see the video i always take the whole thing in my left hand i do not keep on flat surface so that this is actually parallel i have made with the floor so you see that whenever i am dissecting i am changing the left hand position from like you are giving a superior rectus bridal suture then you you bring the thing more horizontal when you are going to the other end like 6 o'clock position you start at 12 o'clock then 6 o'clock position you are actually tilting it towards you so that perforation should not happen and you remain po back surface parallel this is easy with catena but difficult with steel models so orientation of the rts and so i am showing this is again i have taken external camera and this is the microscopic view you see that my thing is little tilted towards the 6 o'clock position then i actually dissecting it till i that meet point is very important for me when i reach at the dome that is the dome of the cornea so i stop there 
I take at that point the second instrument. At the same time, you have to make clockwise and anti-clockwise movement of your fingers so that you can reach the periphery towards three o'clock or nine o'clock position. When you are reaching towards six o'clock position, you actually tilting it towards you. You see in the left hand side video and you actually very fast you can go into the six o'clock position and check 360 degree that your tip of the blade should touch the limbus. Then is right thickness. That as I have already told that the right thickness, you have to choose the right initial blade. So guarded blade is always better. So right thickness EK is between 100 to 150 micron. This is usual. So, and we know that automated dissection, there is a peripheral thickness is more than the central thickness because it is front surface parallel. And if you see that manual dissection, peripheral is almost same. It is not that like automated one because we are back surface polar. Ultra thin dissection is possible with, then you have to be a little experienced with the, your technique. When you are experienced, then you can have ultra thin like uh, Busin, what he showed in 2013, that ultra thin is 80 micron or less. It is highly possible in manual dissect. But you have to, people have uh, tried double uh, twice, that you can also try. But initially you try to remain between 100 to 150. The, these are some example that you can do ultra thin. So manual dissection, I have uh, experienced the uh, previous few hundred sample and ulnar lenticular thickness between 68 to 240 micron, different uh, with different kind of media. But the main peri important thing that 400 or 450 micron for the peripheral cuts, that is very important. Then you know that all the complication will happen with automated as well as manual, same DM perforation, button holding, and uh, uh, but, uh, sometimes you may miss the plane, not complete cut, all these things similarly happens. Both the things are similar. If you see that this we had published that actually perforation happens very rarely, very thick donor things happens, button holding happens, like your, you compare with your SICS incision, similar kind of thing happens. And also too thin uh, donor, uh, difficult to handle, this is also happens. So this was my, uh, I mean, five years back, this was my decimate membrane perforation only in three cases and two thin donor, maybe 140, 150 cases. But only in few cases, I needed to change the donor with a new one, only less than 1%. So long-term results, if you see, this was done in 2007. It was combined with SICS and see that after 12 years, the cell count is 1528. This was three months, this is uh, 12 years. And another figure, this is actually very interesting that accidental betadine was given intracamerally and patient developed immediate stas plus PBK. And I did this is, it was my fourth case. And this patient showed me last month only, every year he used to come and you see that endothelial cell count is so good, so good. So that way manual dissection is excellent. There is no inferior than the uh, uh, automated one. So I am now going switch over to uh, 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 my dissection part. So you see that whatever I have shown, I first close the one hole with Helon. Then I put a little BSS through the other. There are two, two tubes, so one tube. So I keep this fluid mixed with, this is just, uh, I do it, there is no uh, definite Reason only thing that inner coat should, inner, inner endothelial layer should be coated. 
This is the graft. And you see that as I told you, there is little bit of iris tissue is there. So I need to remove that iris tissue before mounting. This is very important. Otherwise, your tissue mounting on the anterior chamber will not be happening perfectly. So when you're done with this, you put the button. I always prefer little air. I go back to the Millis technique of air fluid interface technique of dissecting manual dull. Similar technique, I use it. So you put tissue retainer, then locking ring. Then you have to put air through the other end. So when you put air, little more air will be there. And you close both the, both the I do not put any syringe in any of the tubes. So remove all the epithelium. These are edematous epithelium. Even it is not edematous. If you remove it, you are 50 micron thinner. So put a central mark. This is very important to know the where is the center of the cornea. Then I give always give a template mark. This is 8.5 template. So I, as I told that I choose where is the side, where the sclera is more exposed. Otherwise the hinge of the uh, blade, crescent blade or that thing will hamper with your smooth going. So I choose this area. I, this is a prefixed 450 micron braid. I give a straight incision there. So now these are all real time, no editing here. So now I use this crescent. This is regular crescent. Sometimes I have to do SICS, then I do this. I use this one. So with side to side, nice movement, you go little bit anticlockwise. When you go to the right side, anticlockwise movement, your left hand. And when you are going towards the three o'clock, then you are, this thing is little bit clockwise. Then you can reach easily periphery. When you reach the periphery, not necessarily you go to the top of the, now you use this one. This is actually side to side. This is my very good old friend, this blade uh, with me. This is very handy to me. And I just go like this. This is real time. Dr. So, Buster, did you optimize your video before sharing? Because the video is playing, but it's a little choppy. Otherwise, you can stop share, share again. But below there is a button called Optimize My Video. Just click that. Then I think video. the video will play much smoother. Optimize video, where is there? In the original screen, you have to stop sharing. And okay. then when you, again, when you share screen, below there will be a button called Optimize. Stop sharing first. Stop sharing. Even. Even without share, uh, stopping share, you can do view option in that you can optimize the video. No, in Zoom, you'll have to see. Mm. Zoom, okay. I've lost. View options on top, top of the screen, you have view option. Yeah. It had come in the floating bar when you had seen. No, I cannot see. Where is. No, just, just stop share. Then you'll come to the main screen. No, I cannot find out that stop share. Oh, that is because it's and here I stop share. It's okay. Yeah. I stop share. Yeah. Now what yeah. I'll do? And view, view option, you can... Where is the view option? Oh, Dr. Basak, your slide are still uh, shared, so it's, it's yeah. not stop sharing. Okay, yeah. stop share. Stop share. Uh -huh. now, now you share... And before you select your PowerPoint, you can go down and optimize my video. And now you, I have to share. Share. Okay. And then you will see, bottom you will see, share. optimize my video. Oh, share. No, you've already started sharing. Before you share, oh. when you click share, before you select PowerPoint, there will be a button below saying, optimize my video. There will be two tick boxes. One of them is optimize my video. Again, uh, stop share. Uh, no. Stop. Now it is stopped. Yeah, now it is stopped. Click on. Uh. So. 
you just uh, click share on Zoom, and then before you select the PowerPoint presentation, click the optimization. Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Once share you screen. click the share screen, optimize my video. Okay. Click, and then you now share. Now I I I'll go to the video. Video. Okay. Yeah. Now you can see. Yeah, yeah, we can see. Now you can go full screen, go to your video, to the same point where you are playing. Okay. Okay. So we are actually uh, almost so. Uh, yeah. So we are here. Correct. So when we finish, you just check you have actually touched all 360 degree with the tip of the blade. You just, this point is very important. You just unlock that two pinch cock, and then otherwise there will be little, I mean, suck, suction effect. So you take the tissue on a Teflon block, put some BSS. So normally I do in between, but as because it is with the manual dissection for I am showing this part earlier. Now we'll go to the surgery. So this is a one-eyed lady, 69 years, PBK, one by 60 vision, pass in the upper part, probably vitreous in the wound, and upper limbus is little ectatic. So first you have to go for epidebridement. There are many ways, whatever some people use only iris spatula to do it, some people use Excel sponge, but you have to do it. Then little bit of bleeding happens, then now your view is more clearer. Now, again, I give a eight point template mark. This is to identify where is my eight millimeter mark. So this cornea is smaller cornea. So graft sizing is also determined here. So probably my mental calculation, 7.5 millimeter. First thing is side port. This is my usual. I am approaching from superior part because this wound I have to little bit uh, carefully, I have to put more suture so I can make it a little flatter. Then I always put this ink, I mean, uh, and the side port blade, because at the end of the surgery, sometime you miss that. Uh, this I actually identified it. So trypan glue injection, I always give when I used to do like mentally, I am that I'll do under OVD, this desmetodexis. So it will take little time to stand it. Then superior after probably this was only ECC was done, no SICS, no FECO in this particular case. History not get, this was about five to six years back, the surgery was done elsewhere. So you do cauterize, cauterization is with. I always go uh, sclerocorneal tunnel. It is because you, you will get little more space and also the astigmatic point of view, it is also important. So again, those who are doing SICS, this is not a big deal to make a little tunnel so that you could go at least one millimeter anterior to the limbus. That is very important. Most of the time I do not put suture, but in this case I plan that I, I will have to put suture to make it a little flatter in the upper part. So, then you see that I have to measure it, what is it? So it is 5.5 millimeters. So 5.5 millimeter is important, is uh, incision is important for this push through technique with the needle. You see that vitreous popped. So I have to now mentally prepare that vitrectomy will have to do in this particular case. So I was that uh, trypan blue, put little hill on, but vitreous probably one knuckle is there. When I did the vitrectomy, I could see this knuckle was cut with the usual old technique. Now I use the vitrector to mainly in the upper part, I am using it. Because lower part, if you see the air bubble movement, it is moving fine. So lower part, the vitreous is not there. So upper part, I am only uh, uh, releasing, uh, uh, cutting the vitreous so that 
it should not come through the wound and it should not entangle with the your uh, disaclenticut so again i put little bit pilo to see that how the uh, pupil is behaving now the synecolysis part so because upper part you know the iris wound and a knuckle of vitreous all in the wound so i have to free it so from both side i am using to uh, clear the synechia as far as possible so from the wound i am separating the iris because these are important for dmac these are the difficult cases of course and this patient is one eyed so now after giving helon i am doing desmetorexis so a lot of people has asked question i think rajesh can discuss other types of desmetorexis this is you see the trypan blue staining actually help to identify and when you are doing it you can see it you are completely removing it from the periphery and when you are doing it you just it is not coming out because it is entangled with iris you see that now iris pigments everything is coming so this part is over now i used to use this this is again my favorite simple simple cannula i remove the helon now i have to go for pi i was thinking that in this particular case they are might go posteriorly so as a preventive measure i have done one inferior pi normally i do not do pi in a routine case excellent anterior chamber anatomy there is no need of doing a pi in dissect but dmac it is mostly mandatory so then i put the air to check how the things are so air is retaining air is retaining and little bit multiple bubble is there but it is finally doing fine so i have to enlarge the incision so i enlarge this incision now to that parallel like 5.5 mm one little but this incision is not a very good because of multiple problems are here so again check the fluid depth how the ac is forming again washing all the wash is very important because here visco is one thing and another is vitreous is there so both the things are important here so probably vitreous is not there in the anterior chamber so i didn't do uh, tramsilon assisted uh, vitrectomy here because it is only limited to the upper limbus so again little bit helon might be there so air is not forming so i cleared all the ovds from the anterior chamber because that corner are a little because synechia is from uh, say almost 120 uh, to 140 degree now the air bubble is fine nicely though they are now sizing of the graph as i was telling that first part is 8.5 this is 7.5 mm so i choose 7.5 mm trifine so i cleared all the air now ac is formed ac is deepened little bit hydro of the side port so that this thing now the donut preparation and sizing already it is decided that it is 7.5 mm graph so you see the nice marks are there this mark is very important and i use this simple modu strepine it is just like this and you always check that you are through this is very important step otherwise you will feel that you are not cut through and through sometimes it stuck to the refine so i use a 30 gauge needle to push little so one edge popped out and you take the thing out so the thing is ready now put few drops of bss over it so now go, go back to patient's cornea this is 30 gauge needle so i little bend it so that negotiation will be easier i put uh, this helon all over here 
including the drape, because the whole graft will be lying there. So I put the graft there. So, so normally it is not required to mark for push in technique, but I always, because a lot of fellows, trainees, all every, everybody is there. So I always have a habit of giving a, a smart. So you put the whole thing there so that it is perfectly all right. So your hand is like uh, 30 gauge needle, no water, nothing is there. People use BSS field or air field. It go, you go slowly. So it is done. So it takes actually three, four seconds to put the thing in and it is perfectly all right. So you put little BSS, make the chamber deeper. deeper. Now you have to put from the other end air. So air has been placed. Now the donor centration is important. As because air is coming out, centration, okay, little bit centering is done. Now you see that I am putting sutures. So you have to secure this wound. This wound is not very secured. In normally, in routine, good cases, I don't put any suture actually. So two, three sutures will be required in this case. So sutures are given. Then you put again more air. So now you see that air is, you can see the golden ring, all those things are there. Your centering will be now a bit better if you have sufficient air, too small air, more tight, it will not cause. That air is still leaking from the main wound. So I have to put another suture here. So these are very important tips. Otherwise, aqueous will leak and the patient will have shallow anterior chamber and probably the graft will attach to the uh, this thing, iris. There will be no donor dislocation. But when I put this, this thing is, as because I had that day luxury of using glue, I put glue in this case because next case is my pterygium case so with glue. So I had glue prepared. So I put glue in this case, but you can just cauterize at the edge of the conjunctiva. So when this is done, so is sure that it is uh, nicely. This is for showing I am doing. This is one of the way to center it, this is just for demo I am showing it, to check venting incision normally not required, but some of the cases is required to check your interface fluid is there. In this case, there was no interface fluid. And you see that I checked the all wounds. So in between 30 minutes, I did the pterygium surgery. I came back to the table. Patient lied on the table for 30 minutes because of that air. I had a fear that air might go posteriorly. After 30 minutes, you see that all the clarity has improved. I, uh, little BSS here has been exchanged. And you see that I checked it, no further leakage. So I asked the patient to move the eyes from this side, that side, how the air is behaving. This eye is little abnormal eye. So air is not moving and still the uh, block effect is there. So I put a bandage contact lens so that patient should remain comfortable. And you see that uh, because this is, she is one eyed lady and uh, her other lead movement completely actually uh, came back. So this is the surgery you see that, but closer of the lead is also important. You leave the eyelids if the patient is under block, this patient is fine. But unlike cataracts, you leave the lid a little bit and then close the lid. Otherwise, the air may sometimes come out if you go uh, uh, like usual way. Next slide. Huh? Ah. 
So this patient, actually I showed this patient. This is the other eye, right eye. This is left eye pre-off, left eye. And you see that day three, today morning I saw this patient and you see that patient was perfectly all right. No air bubble is there. Probably some posterior or all has absorbed by two and a half days. And patient, you see that much clarity compared to upper graph. And she is having 636 vision from 160 vision. Penal vision is improving to 618. And this is the anterior chamber ASOCT. You see that. ASOCT is the graph thickness is acceptable in this particular, we know with time this graph thickness will be reduced. So manual dissect is good, fast, reproducible, least costly, affordable with same outcomes. It is actually fit for developing world. You see that this dissection part actually hardly takes one minute time. If you go the whole dissection of that video, it was like three minutes because I was demo giving demonstration. So it is very good. So same technique over the last 15 years, that was my figure. And you see that the results you are giving, it is a consistent result. There is no other different kind of results. I can show this on and on and on, and I keep my track records very archiving is very good and you see that you will see plenty of these images are there all are doing good Excellent. so another one minute or two minutes so now dimec you are we are on manual dissection only so we are reinventing the wheel so need to rethink about huge investment on expensive microkeratome unless you have a very good volume. So practice manual. For developing countries, the choice of EK will be either manual DSEC or DMEC. Thank you very much for your patience, Yari. Thank you for the excellent and detailed talk, sir. Uh, really a lot of things to take back home. Uh, but I agree uh, manual DSEC is a boon for people uh, who don't have access to microkeratome. Uh, thank you so much for such a lovely talk. Sir, I've had just one question. Uh, what is the blade of your choice? Like the first cut that you put for... Uh, I have a, that uh, diamond blade, whichever you have. So okay. some company is making prefix. They made it for me like 400, 450 and 500 micron. So okay. it is going for last 12, 13 years. It doesn't... When it is... When I, I mean, cost effective, very far... I mean, part tissue cost, nothing is there. Otherwise, there are, there are many people are making it, but you know that Indian measurement in micron is a uh, little problem. So I do not, uh, so you take a good diamond blade, it will go for your other surgeries also. There are step diamond blades, so you can use those step diamond blade also. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question uh, from the audience, like um, from, the, from Dr. Gokhale. What are the settings that you used for doing PI with the vitrector, sir? Any tips to avoid mm -hmm. bleeding while doing that? Low, 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 low setting. I mean, I, I mean, 600 or 800 cuts and all low parameters. Just you give two, one, two, three, three, three press mm -hmm. that actually cuts. Not your normal vitrector, vitrectomy kind of setting. I use a setting of vacuum of about 250 because I want the tip to catch the iris. Mm -hmm. And the cutting rate, you can keep as low as 200, 250 as well. Because if you keep it very high, because you're not trying to cut the vitreous. Here, mm -hmm. you're trying to cut the iris. And also, remember not to keep your foot switch down for a very long period of time. I Otherwise, it will... Good eat up a lot of iris and it will bring the vitreous also from behind. So just give a few cuts, check, and then if required, uh, give a few cuts again. And before you uh, let go of the iris, release your foot switch, let the fluid flow, and then you can, you know, gently, otherwise sometimes the iris can get entangled in your tip. And if you're not very careful, 
you can create uh, you know uh, uh, iris tear or bleeding from there which can be induced absolutely one of the things in this case dr basak i would say that at least for the beginning person is that uh, we know that the patient had uh, the extra capsular surgery at the superior limbus so maybe because that area to create a fresh wound can sometimes be a little bit tricky not only to make the wound even while closure you may have difficulty that you may have to put more sutures it can still continue to right, be right right so temporal so it's a temporal approach you can create a fresh wound and you can have more control over the wound construction and that need not complicate the surgery in your hands it works because you are an experienced surgeon even in that side you were able to create a good wound but if somebody messes up the wound then rest of the surgical step itself will get compromised because the chamber will keep collapsing all the time and i would have also preferred to do a superior pupilloplasty maybe i would have put a sepsir knot just to approximate the iris superiorly which would have prevented my air bubble from going behind because that superior area where you have done the vitrectomy as soon as the patient sits up sometimes the air can go behind into yeah. the posterior cavity and it does not Absolutely. come back anteriorly so there was one more question where somebody had posed uh, using the sliding technique are you worried about viscoelastic getting into the interface so how do you prevent the viscoelastic from getting into the interface normally normally interface if it it goes by one go there is minimal chance but if you hesitate and there is a hole particularly with thinner tissue then uh, there might be a possibility folding so thinner tissue so little bit thicker tissue like in this case maybe 120 micron in this case so it always in one go so that is the only thing and to check it that's why venting incision is important in this particular case where you are using sliding here additional vitre so you give venting incision 3 or 4 or 2 and check that anything interface fluid is there that will come out uh, the another question which people had was when you use a needle and you push the tissue in sometimes the needle does not disengage from the donor so what are your surgical tips how can you prevent that people, or, or if you have it what are the ways of getting over it i know i know that uh, that is a question but uh, very difficult to answer i mean you you actually if you use that uh, bss in the syringe you can use to you can actually inject bss during if you feel that Uh, your uh, needle is engaged with the tissue at which point is it said when you are completely in there is nothing you can use your left hand to use some side port and put another instrument to disengage it but one usually of point, one of the points i saw in your video is that you did not bend the tip of the needle no any... no 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 bending no bending so, yeah so your needle was straight so basically straight, straight. it engages the tissue when you are pushing forward and when you are pulling out that it because there out. is no bend the needle comes out straight away yes sometimes, yes sometimes so people used to do bend, bend right needle. right right like absolute bend, of course yeah so if you bend the needle and then when uh, you are pressing on the bend, tissue no right the bend goes into the stroma and then when you are pushing no, i never the, i never bend the tip correct the other tip that i tell people is that when you are trying to disengage if you are not able to disengage you lift up the needle against the back surface of the cornea so the back surface of the cornea will act like a resistance to help disengage the donor from your needle rather than just pulling it out which I which case sometimes the tissue can come out with your needle itself another thing is that i i was discussing that it is not about the needle if you make your port little bigger say 6 6.5 you simply use your sinski hook okay. to push it in i use that long time back then your incision should be little i mean larger but 6.5 is no deep, i mean nothing wrong in it so it is otherwise good any other questions ramya or divyani i think uh, 
you know sir i think sir, all the questions were pertaining to getting a very thin and uniform graft in through manual dissection i think which sir explained very nicely so uh, yes if i could just ask a question uh, is there any difference when you put in a needle push through for a thin for a say a 90 micron tissue versus a 150 micron tissue what are the steps that you would do differently normally i do not do <laughs> needle technique whatever needle technique maybe i use my 10% of cases but i usually do still take off fold technique 60 40 ratio that is very good going in for thinner graft that is the probably the best thing can you can always uh, manipulate that but thin graft needle is sometimes it make try fold sometimes you will see that it may get reverse like your dimac graft then you will have problem so thin tissue needle tackling probably is not other i mean bosin glide or other technique is good but tacofel technique i am perfectly all right so sir uh, which conditions would you use needle grafts needle for putting the grafts like you said 10% so what would be those uh, 10% like these this are the case where I, i i can anticipate that anterior chamber anatomy is difficult like aphakic cases also like uh, post keratoplasty cases post pk cases where i find that uh, okay the iris structure is not good the needle means i am not actually cannot depend the anterior chamber so much that unfolding is difficult i can but i mean that way the shallower the anterior chamber Uh, there is a point that i go straight because you are not opening up the anterior chamber too much and at the same time you do not have scope to depend the anterior chamber that much then you have to use anterior chamber maintainer like rajya sometimes do so these are i mean there is no hard and fast rule in this but whichever uh, technique you are comfortable i think if you practice it any 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 surgery can be i mean done smoothly by the so same you so you do not use bucin glide no i tried long time back i have still my in the over but i do not like because time consuming all these thing is making this thing that thing so basically it is a like 12 minute surgery for me and that is enough so uh, not uh, so anterior chamber maintainer and dependent on uh, assistant to uh, like all this all those uh, videos we have seen so all those it is going good in my hand so i do not want to change it so that is the main thing so there was this question on glued i will uh, would you do at the same sitting or would you do it as a second mm, sitting no nah. whatever i have experience i take the help of vr colleague no uh, they actually do better better job as as far as glued iol is concerned because anterior segment surgeon doing glued iol is having problem in long run of trd or other thing because we cannot do very pars plana approach and doing vitrectomy then a proper glued iol i may be doing in the same sitting but i prefer to give a gap of say 6 weeks 8 weeks time to subside the inflammation the reaction and then i put planned with i think the chances of detachment are also more because you the globe tends to become hypotenuse and then uh, yes, all, chances of graft problem. detachment are more we did a study where we compared single stage versus uh, two stage glue diol with dissect and we found that attachment rates were significantly higher in those where they were combined vis a vis where they were sitting. where they were used in two stages right, right. i do not have very good experience with single sitting so we okay. have one more question next. Uh, how do you think take next, your... next <laughs> speaker we are having <laughs> okay. so for that... those of us who do have access to a microkeratome the skill of getting a thin graft with a microkeratome is a very difficult task uh, dr namrata sharma has very graciously agreed to let us in on her secrets to a thin lenticule with a microkeratome and how to use it in uh, the, how to insert it in your views and light over to you ma'am thank you ramya and thank you devyani for doing a great job thank you for having me in Thank and thank you dr rajesh and dr geeta for in 
envisioning this session, which I think is has great learning trip tips. So my I'm going to be showing you some videos and uh, because it had to be video based, so I've not put too many slides on it. Just to say how you prepare the graph. Now, as far as uh, our country is concerned, uh, we have ever since the DSEC came in, always prepared our own graphs as surgeons. But I know that uh, people do prepare their, uh, the, the grafts are prepared in the eye bank. And so people do get uh, pre-cut tissue, uh, which is also a very good option. But if you want to do it yourself, or if you don't want to do it yourself, uh, important thing is that you should know how it is done. So when you do a single pass microkeratome technique for ultra thin lenticule, and this is the most, most popular technique, you measure the epithelium of pachymetry. You can do it with ultrasonic pachymetry or with the MIOCT and then use appropriate keratome head. And what we basically see, I think not 80 microns, what we basically see after measuring uh, pachymetry is that at least 100 microns should remain and maintain the tight artificial chamber and make the microkeratome pass. I think that is the most important thing. And then of course you can again measure it with the pachymetry. So this is to show how we do it. This is the, there are two microkeratomes which are available currently in India. I don't know if there are others. One is by Gibor and the other is by Moria. And ever since Moria microkeratome has come in, it has changed the way we do uh, surgeries. We've all gone from uh, full thickness to partial thickness surgeries, and this is how we uh, prepare the uh, graft. So basically, uh, this is the micro uh, artificial chamber is filled with the column of BSS and just uh, trying to see that there are no air bubbles, which is there, because if you put the graft on this and the air bubbles are there, then that can always interfere. So very slowly or very gently, you put the corneoscleral rim onto this uh, micro keratome and then after doing this uh, you can put the fluid off it will not go anywhere also see that it is centered completely so this golden ring that you see should be seen all around uniformly it should not be that this is thinner here and thicker here so you would know that this is centered completely and if it, if it goes off the center like that then again you'll make out that it is only semi-lunar or it is only three-fourth of a lunar so this is important and uh, then uh, following this, uh, it is ensured that no air bubbles, they, ent uh, they enter the artificial chamber under the button. And now you can put it off because if you put it on, then the fluid will keep flowing and you know the graph will keep moving. So then after this, this cap is uh, put and uh, the corneal button with the scleral rim, of course, should be uh, good for these cases, at least two millimeters. And the BSS continues to flow under the button and then you tighten this uh, cap and once this is tightened. How do you know it is tightened? Once you screw it up completely, then what you do is your bottle height has to be high and your flow has to be on and you keep it there for some time. When you keep it there for some time, the pressure gradually builds up here. And when you've done that, then you clamp it at 30 centimeters and you clamp the fluid, uh, uh, the IV line also. Because then in that column of the uh, tubing, the, uh, the, the fluid would be there and that would ensure that it is completely tightened and the pressure is uh, built up well. Now this epithelium debridement I would do based on whether, what is the corneal thickness. So if say cornea is thicker, then I would do the epithelial debridement and we do have the scale which can you know measure the corneal thickness or alternatively one can use ultrasonic pachymetry. But if say the cornea, they say is only 520 microns, then probably I will not, you know, or 500 microns or if it's a thinner cornea, then probably I will not do epithelial debridement. So this is done. The idea is to get thinner graft. So if you debride the epithelium, you would get still thinner graft, but of course not at the cost of perforation. So one has to be careful about that. So after this epithelium is debrided, one again measures the corneal thickness. And then after uh, measuring the uh, corneal thickness, uh, you can, uh, we've standardized it. So uh, you measure it with the help of the scale, you multiply it by a magnification factor of 1.25 in here also you can measure in the newer versions it gives you the scale here. And after doing this, uh, one you plan accordingly. So keep about uh, 100 microns behind. So this is about 450 microns. So the corneal thickness is about 550 microns and it will always cut more than what you think it would. With Gebor, it will be always less than what you think. With micro, with Moria, it will always be more. Moria is for more. So if you plan to say, if you say, if you think that you've got say 500 microns, no, it will not be. It will be more than 500 microns. So that has to be kept in mind. 
and single pass of the appropriate thickness will allow this thin lenticule. And here the thickness was measured at 40 to 50 microns. Although we aimed at, you know, uh, keeping it was 550 and we thought we'll use 450. So that is why I say always keep 100 microns bed there and it will always cut more. But if it is Gebor, it will always cut less than what you have actually aimed for. So this is uh, the difference between the two machines. An important thing here, of course, I could not capture here, but you have to put blue marks here on the side because when you flip this up the other way around, you will not be able to see it. So with the help of the Sinsky hook, you stain it with the gentian violet and you just see this is about 50 microns of cornea, which is there. Stain it and then flip that whole artificial anterior chamber uh, onto the other side and then gently uh, remove the corneoscleral rim. Otherwise, it's very difficult. If you put the fluid on, put the fluid off and then it goes pachak like that. So, you know, you might, sorry, you might, leave, you might uh, lose some cells there which you don't want to uh, lose. And so uh, that is why I always reverse that thing and uh, then uh, take that uh, uh, corneoscleral, uh, take that uh, corneoscleral rim out or the, take the graft out, which is now only 40 to uh, 50 microns. So this is, uh, and you can see so many folds there. That is because the graft is so damn thin and it is easily picked up on the reverse side, better picked up on the reverse side than on the other side. And then after doing this, this is put onto the Teflon block, put a little bit of fluid there because you don't want that thin graft to be sitting on the, uh, on the dry uh, Teflon block. And these are the marks that I was talking about. These are the marks that are put inside because when you flip it on the other side and the graft is so thin, <coughs> you will be able to see, you know, where you have to actually trip in it. And then you punch in such a way that all your blue marks are outside it. You can't see it. Then you can be absolutely damn sure that you know you are not going eccentric and it is absolutely central. So that is the idea of doing this. Now again, like Dr. Basak also said that you have to see that it's not uncut anywhere and very gently pull it up like this so that only the graft you know remains there. Sometimes if the ends are, uh, are still attached, then this may get may get you into trouble. And believe me, it's very difficult to you know then again dissect it. And then I like to just put fluid. Don't put fluid on the cornea because you will. Uh, the endothelial cells, you know, will uh, uh, will will be shed off. So put it just uh, outside the button so that the graft is immersed and then this is kept or already prepared for the next case. Of course, uh, you have to see that whatever your size of the corneal diameter is, you minus three millimeters from there or three and a half millimeters from there, and that should be the size of your graft. Now, uh, graft loading on modified Bucin's glide with a no touch technique. Now, this was your graft there with the fluid. And uh, Bucin's glide nowadays comes with a plate like this. So, there are two ways of doing it. One, that you make a swimming pool out of it. So, you put fluid here and fl fluid here, and then tilt this Teflon block a little bit. And in this swimming pool, this graft will itself float. So, you are not going to touch it at all. It will go and float, and by the capillary action, it will come here. So uh, you can nudge it a little bit, although I don't like it and probably it's not captured that well, but just tilt this Teflon block a little bit and make a triangle out of this edge and the Teflon block and it comes there. Then put fluid again and maybe you can nudge it with a sponge or you can nudge it with the cannula. And even if you don't nudge it, you just, just see the fluid is only being removed. If you remove the fluid, the graft starts to move in this pole that is there. So the gl glide is now completely wetted and now you have to get this circular graft into your area here, your area here. And then, you know, you can slide it like this with the help of cannula that also helps. Now this edge is lifted. It is lifted like, you know, you have your, uh, uh, so what you have to do is you have to, you have to use this sponge and you have to push it back. The moment you use this sponge, it becomes dry. This edge, which is lifted will fall back on its own. And then once the graft edge falls down on its own, see you're, I'm doing nothing except that I'm just uh, with the capillary action with the mirosol sponge, just trying to see that, you know, the fluid comes out. And then this, this goes down like this. Now after this, you can take ILM peeling forceps, Bucin's forceps also come, but if you don't have it, you can always uh, take this ILM peeling forceps. You can uh, bend it a little bit. And then with the help of the ILM peeling forceps, you can pull the graft to the edge. Now this is the edge, but pull it slightly, slightly, a little bit more than this edge and stain it with tripan blue if you're a novice surgeon. And as you 
leave this pronate your hand because if it is so thin the moment you try to pull it out it is going to get the whole thing is going to be pulled out and this may not leave which dr rajesh kogla was saying it may not leave so you pronate your hand a little bit and when you pronate your hand a little bit this forceps will be willing to leave this thin graft that is there now this is just to show that it it actually sits on the uh, floats on the tissue fluid like this and when you absorb it uh, with the help of the capillary action over here then it just falls back but the layer of fluid still would be there and that's good because you don't want it completely dry so these are these are the just uh, advantages that there are no wrinkles with the no touch technique and you have hardly any endothelial cell loss now uh, of course this is not a great case to show because the cornea is hazy the epithelium has been debrided but uh, these are the cases that we do we don't get very clean cases to do so you can see that the thick pannus in the epithelium has been uh, debrided here so a 3.5 mm mark is made i always like to use scleral incisions like uh, dr basak has shown because i feel this part of the cornea should remain untouched i mean manipulating through the corneal uh, this thing is not a great idea to do and then you give a mark over here with the help of a this thing a blade breaker and then with the help of the crescent blade sorry with the help of the crescent blade going about 1 mm at the back 0.5 mm and this is the ilm peeling forceps which is being inserted now this is inserted here like this sometimes what happens is you are trying to insert and you can't find where to insert so with the help of a vanas or with the help sorry with the help of the macpherson or with the limbs just ask your assistant or yourself just nudge this down so that this forceps you know comes out and again open it to see open this forceps to see that the jaws are opening because sometimes this is a little longish if you do it with a bucins uh, uh, bucins uh, forceps probably that is not a problem but i only feel that it is thicker than this forceps uh, because the 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 jaws that it has are shorter so once you do this uh, the the bucins glide your graft is already loaded so you uh, just reverse the bucins glide and the graft will go nowhere and uh, then just hold on to this edge of the graft there you can see that bluish tinge is there even if you lose it you can make out where it is drop the whole assembly inside and then pull the graft and then take this bucin glide away and your ac maintainer at this point in time is off because you don't want your graft going here and there and as soon as you come here now your ac maintainer is on because the graft will unfurl like an umbrella there and now again this is very thin if you take this out like this the graft might also come out just like your dnac graft so what you do is again pronate twist your hand a little bit and once you twist it will leave it there only so and then uh, the graft is inserted the air bubble is uh, in, uh, instilled and notice that this is you know uh, eccentric so don't try to uh, give external massage with the uh, with the uh, with the distal part of the cannula always do it with this edge you can be very ruthless it doesn't matter you're not touching the graft just to center it so just uh, give those uh, nudging movements as is shown here and the graft will get uh, centered and then subsequently after it gets centered i don't think i can't remember when i've given drainage incisions i'm so glad sir showed it because i was wondering i don't you know have that kind of a movie to show but they just center it and it will very nicely sit on to your uh, over you can see very nicely with hardly any gaps there the graft will be uh, you know uh, sitting there and then you can put a glue over here uh, um, and can suture this part as well so uh, this is important and if you are a novice surgeon always plan this also where your incision would be i like to do my incision if, I, if it's a right eye left eye differently because i would you know for a right eye i would do it a little supranasally and then try to take it out temporarily the this this part where ilm peeling forceps is put so that you know the nose doesn't obstruct your thing now this is just to show very hazy cornea ultra thin graft so you have to look at the contour now this is upside down you can make out that this is upside down because this is going on the curvature of the cornea so you flip it up and now you can see that this is going along the curvature of the cornea and this is on the correct side so if you have not already stamped it and if your corneas are this hazy then it can uh, be a little trouble and so uh, one has to be careful about it but as soon as you put the air bubble the whole morphology you know becomes so beautiful 
uh, then this is just to show re-desec in a case of duphthalmos where your AC is so voluminous. So this is a repeat desec which is being done and it comes out quite easily. There is no uh, skill involved in removing it. You can just do it with a reverse Sinsky and it will come out. This was almost uh, four years after the initial graft was done. And it comes out very easily and it is edematous. So it might take a little, uh, you know, it will be a little slippery. But then that's fine. And you can see that the AC maintainer is here. And again, the graft is, uh, the Bucell's Clyde B uh, is placed here. And uh, again, here, either you can put your faucets, you can put your uh, limbs here because you don't, this might again come out from the other side. So important thing is you can put your limbs here or you can twist your hand. And at this point in time, the AC maintainer should be on so that the graft you know, unfurls itself like an umbrella. And then uh, either put a forceps here or twist your hand a little bit so that your, uh, uh, see, I put uh, a forceps here so that uh, I don't uh, pull the graft out because uh, again, this graft is uh, very thin. And in a buphthalmos, it's so voluminous, it looks although it is uh, as though it is eccentric. It is not eccentric. Only thing is that the AC is too, uh, AC is, uh, uh, the AC uh, chamber, AC is too deep. So as soon as you put the graph, first thing I think I do is put the air there. Wherever it is getting stuck, it doesn't matter. You can uh, desec graph, you can always manipulate it into a position after nudging it along. Because if it is on the iris or if it is freely floating inside the anterior chamber, then it becomes a little more difficult. And these are just ultra thin desecs to show that you can hardly make out that where the graft is, it is so damn thin. Uh, this I'm just showing for the fact that CHED can be a real challenge. If you put tripan blue here, you will never be able to see what you have stained. So you can do it with the air bubble because of internal reflection, it will probably show better here. And uh, they're really thick corneas and it is very difficult to take out the uh, this thing. Almost sometimes you can even leave it there. I know some people would say you would leave it there. This is one of our very early cases where we never thought so. And so we try to just scrape it and it does come out uh, like this, although not completely. And then again, this uh, graft is loaded onto the Bucin's glide, done in the same way uh, as I showed you uh, earlier. An important thing in these hazy corneas, what I want to highlight is the graft is inside there, but you don't know where it is. You can't see anything. So you just put the air bubble. As soon as you put the air bubble, because of the internal reflection, you'll be see, able to see the edges of the graft. So as soon as the graft is in, the first thing I do is take off the AC maintainer and put the air bubble beneath the graft. So uh, this, I think I've already, this was a CHAD case, although I've already shown you the preparation, it is pretty much the same, except that here, I just want to show you that we have made these generation wallet marks in the center and in the side, always it helps if you have made these, because when you, when you flip it to punch it, you can actually, you know, see them and you can even uh, remove this from the back and you can always see it. This is the surgery which is being done by the same steps that I have shown you. AC maintainer is being put here. And I wanted to highlight just one more thing here is that if you don't have this intraop OCT microscope and you don't know where your desmet membrane tags are, you can still make out. And that you can make out if you've stained it with a tripan blue. And you can put a crescent there or any metallic instrument there. So when you put a metallic instrument there, you can see these tags and this will come out on its own. But there may be some which are stick, still stuck there. And if they're still stuck there, you, on this crescent, uh, which is used as a platform, you can actually remove the tags with the help of the uh, ILM peeling forceps, et cetera. And this crescent reflector will also help to stabilize your tags so that the tags are not moving here, there, helter, skelter everywhere. You are trying to chase them amidst the fluid and they are just not coming out. So just notice here that, you know, in this, for instance, there were tags which were there after putting the reflector. You can see these tags are there. And then we've stabilized this on a crescent reflector and very easily then you can, you know, pull it. And then again, inspect. If you don't have this intra OCT microscope, just inspect to see, you know, where, uh, where your tags are. And again, this is again loaded onto the Bucin's glide, put in the faucets there. Now here it's so thick, it may not come out. If it doesn't come out with this uh, McPherson forceps, uh, you guide it so that it comes out. Again, open it outside to see whether it is opening or not. And then you can uh, hold on to the edge of the graph, dock the whole thing in, and again, pull it inside. 
and then like i told you earlier this may you have to twist your hand or use another instrument so that you don't come out with a graph you know with it and then first thing that you do is put the ac maintainer off and put the air bubble there the moment you put the air bubble there you can see the edges of the graph and then you can manipulate or may not manipulate or uh, if it is required you can do it and then uh, one can you know center it and in this a bandage contact lens is also placed and this is the desec after shed uh, i think it's most gratifying to do desec after shed and after most so thank you very much for your kind attention and if there are any questions i would be happy to take that Very Thanks. nice presentation, Namrata. <laughs> they were mostly unedited. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful videos and nice to hear you speak extempore because rest of your talks have become so we have we have heard them so many times. So this was yeah, sound I, so I, nice. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I've almost mugged them up. So this I couldn't because it was a. So that's what I'm saying, you know. So this was this was nice to hear you talk something different than what you usually talk. Beautiful videos. Yes, uh, Ramya and Devani, you can go ahead with the questions. We have a couple of questions, ma'am. Uh, so people <clears throat> want to know that as a beginner, what kind of case is ideal for a DSEC? When they get a pre-cut tissue also, they want to know what kind of case would be ideal for them to start off with. Uh, ideal cases would be where the visibility is not this much compromised as I showed you, but these are the kind of cases that we get to do. And the anterior chamber is deep. I mean, it's not uh, shallow. At least it should be three millimeters plus, although people are doing even in shallow anterior chambers now. And the anterior segment anatomy is good. Although DSEC, now we advocate for those cases where anterior segment anatomy is not that good uh, because uh, we have better options uh, like DMET for them. But if you are a beginner, then you choose your case, you know, well. And... Uh, in, in, in layman terms, like again, Rajesh will say, uh, I'm speaking extempore, but like a halua case, absolutely, you know, which has no problems, no complications, because at least in the first five cases, you don't want to go wrong. <clears throat> first five cases, you just do what you have been doing for five times, the same steps, so that at least those steps are rehearsed. It is always, you know, good to watch other people's videos and see, but choose cases which are you know absolutely clean cases not not uh, cases uh, you know which are bad so uh, thank you ma'am i think we had another question as to how to get consistently thin lenticules but because you you only went step by step to show us how to use the microkeratome that was very very useful and uh, if someone is using a pre-cut tissue for the first time is there any precautions that uh, you would suggest for them if they are not cutting the tissue themselves they're getting a pre-cut tissue from an eye bank. So if they are getting a pre-cut tissue, it is important to talk to the eye bank team and know exactly what thickness of the tissue is there. I think that is very important. If somebody has already used that tissue, it would be also useful to fellow eye of that, you know, uh, fellow mm -hmm. eye of that uh, donor. It will be also useful to ask how the tissue behaves and what was, of course, the cut may be a little different. But it is always, I think, best to talk to the person who has cut the tissue as to, you know, uh, what is the thickness of the tissue. That, I think, is most crucial. I think it's very important that if you get a pre-cut tissue from the eye bank, you do those marks at the edge of yeah. the flap, what Namrata was showing, because the eye bank will not give you those marks. So you can flip the tissue over on the epithelial side. If you want, you can remove the cap then use a marking pen or use a Sinsky to mark out the edge so that when you're punching it from the endothelial side, you can punch within the marks because often what happens is pre-cut tissue, people go ahead and punch it out and they realize that one edge is thin and the other edge has become full thickness because they have gone beyond the edge of the flap. So that's very important. Unlike in a manual dissection where you can do limbus to limbus dissection, so that is more forgiving. Here you have a 9.5 millimeter cap, you know, so there, if you are not, centration is not good, often you will end up with one edge becoming thicker. And then, you know, the although you can still go ahead with the surgery, but it doesn't look as neat as what you need to do. Or maybe if you are starting off with a pre-cut, maybe use a 7.5 millimeter trifine lenticule when you're doing that rather than going eight millimeter when you stand a greater risk of punching out one edge. The biggest difference between uh, these uh, these 
uh, sliding technique and the buccin is that the buccin allows you to go through a smaller wound. Mm. Especially the new one which has come with the platform has still made it yet smaller and it's a tri-fold, not a bi-fold. So it's kind of, you know, sitting there like this in a tunnel. Only thing is you have to ensure that it remains in the tunnel. Don't, you know, don't rug row it on the iris and on the... Uh, Correct. Correct. So what, what one way you can learn is if you're not using the buccin glide and you want to do it, maybe in your wet lab or use an artificial chamber, get a donor tissue, practice donor tissue from the eye bank, put it on the artificial chamber, then take a buccin glide and practice with a, you can connect your IV fluid to one of the tubings of the AC maintainer, keep it on so it acts like an AC maintainer, and then practice bimanually of bringing the tissue in. What Namrata was clearly mentioning that sometimes you, in your excitement, you don't let go and you pull out the forceps and half your tissue is sticking out through the paracentesis. And then you have to push it back in. Or sometimes you pull the tissue in, but you forget to switch off the AC maintainer. The moment you let the tissue go, the AC maintainer builds up the pressure and you have the tissue trying to come out through the main wound. So these are things because compared to a sliding technique, which is a single-handed technique, uh, Bucin is a bimanual, you know, you need to use both your hands. So you need to be quite comfortable with the two. So in a shallow AC, which would be your uh, insertion of choice? So would you try to use it with the Bucin glide or would you go with the push-through technique? If you have a patient with, say, a fakey patient or a patient with a basically shallow, shallow AC, you are asking me, I my I do not have too much experience with the sliding technique because we learned from the Bucin glide only, although it looked a little different. There was no platform to it when we started to use it. So I would still go with the Bucin glide. And now because it's become thinner and it's uh, it's become a lot more easier to use. But I'm sure uh, Dr. Basak sir would uh, you know, be happy yeah. to answer that question. Or Rajesh would be because he's probably used both. Still, a sliding technique is in patient in, in a fakic patient especially because we don't want to when you are using sliding technique in a fakic patient you are top of the of your graft so you are towards the corneal stromal side you will not never injure the lens that is very vital but if you use the like tachofold technique or though i use tachofold technique my first case was a fakic case and i did rajesh knew, knew that one so but AC depth is important in that case, but sliding technique is, I mean, you can go easily, but your in wound incision, make it a little larger, nothing will happen. Your astigmatism might be 0.5, either or that, but you will be doing better. And in one go, it will go inside without injuring the lens. Mm. Uh, I have a little different take there. Like sometimes yes. you have cases where uh, the AC is very, very shallow, and where the sliding in actually glides uh, over uh, the anterior uh, chamber content, that time uh, the AC maintainer works well. So it depends on what is the cause of uh, shallow anterior chamber. If you're able to deepen it with the anterior chamber the maintainer, then the Bucin glide, uh, Tans glide, or whatever you know, works in your hand uh, is fine. If you're not able to deepen uh, it, then uh, that can be sometimes disastrous. And especially in very shallow AC, when you're not able to deepen with an artificial anterior chamber, or I'm sorry, AC maintainer, the iris can be floppy and then it pops out uh, with a high pressure and that can be quite uh, messy. So, I mean, you can keep your option open for both. Okay. And also, okay. I like to keep the flap back or the cap back uh, before dismounting it that mm. prevents the collapse of uh, the tissue so that you know, tissue endothelium does not touch uh, to the base and as uh, you know, Dr. Namrata was showing that you can turn it around and then you know, remove it and that also prevents the collapse of the you know. So uh, my uh, that fake versus so if a borderline case, like typically we see in ice cases, ice syndrome cases, where AC is invariably shallow in some parts, it is synechia, et cetera, there, it is better to remove the lens. To do it pseudo fake, so you get in these cases, cornea is also smaller by and large. So you get more spaces and then what you can do, you have plenty of room to play. So like a patient at 36 to 40, 45, I usually do the pseudo I mean, cataract surgery, I combine them with them. 
because I know that cataract will happen in these cases very sooner than the other fake cases because the manipulations are totally different. True. Because even if you succeed in doing your EK and the patient develops a cataract later and he has a shallow AC, you yeah. have a greater chance of damaging. Having yeah. said that, supposing you had a pseudo fake guy and you had a shallow chamber and you had to do an EK, and that's very common in these Chinese eyes and Asian eyes. And there they have successfully managed that by using a sheet slide. The sheet slide prevents the iris from coming out and you can slide the graph very easily. And even if I had to use a bucine glide, maybe I would not make a scleral tunnel. I would try to go corneal because the greater chance of the iris prolapsing in shallow AC through, because my inner lip is going to be more peripheral. So in that scenario, maybe making a clear corneal incision and going a little, the inner lip going a little bit more corneal would be uh, beneficial. You can try making a slightly smaller graft as well, because if you have a shallow anterior chamber, you have a greater risk of developing this peripheral sinecure because your peripheral anterior chamber depth is not going to be too deep. So your edge of the graft can sometimes catch the iris. You can get sinecure unless you are doing an ultra thin DSEC or you're doing a DMAC. But so, otherwise, you can try making the graft a little smaller. I do but other things. In few cases, I have done uh, uh, this thing like preoperative manitol in these cases and parts planar. Single port parts planar. Yeah, you can do that. I've also done that in some cases, a single port. And part they, they actually, it's so nice yeah. that you do your job so nicely. That's the advantage of uh, endoglide. I mean, endoglide has that uh, back uh, uh, surface, which uh, sort of acts like a sheath glide also. So uh, sometimes endoglite also may not be a bad idea. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so we can go to the next talk. Next talk. So our next speaker yeah. is uh, Dr. RF, and he will speak to us regarding uh, the second vitrectomized eye. He's used to different insertion techniques. So we're going to have a look at that. Over to you, sir. So this is a 62-year-old lady who presented with decreased vision. She had history of RD surgery followed by a cataract surgery with silicon oil removal, followed by IOL exchange, a scleral fixated lens was done. And this is how she presented. Hmm. You can see that the cornea looks quite hazy. There is a superior scar from the multiple uh, surgeries that she has undergone. And so we debride the loose epithelium. And it's important that if you have a thick epithelium, sometimes there is a tendency to just try and peel off the entire thing by pulling it off. But that often induces a lot of peripheral bleeding, which ultimately stops. But at times, you can just use a pair of scissors and cut out the thick epithelium, stopping just short of limbus so that you can try avoiding that bleed that tends to come onto your surgical field. And you can see that the pupil is kind of uh, mid dilated. And there are superior sinecia extending from 11 o'clock position going all the way up to maybe 1 o'clock. And there is stromal vascularization in the uh, you know, nasal quadrant. So here, again, choosing, uh, you know, which is the site of main entry, you, you need surgical planning to decide where you're going to make your site ports and where you're going to make the main incision. And uh, because of the retinal detachment surgery and the repeated you know, IOL surgery and the secondary IOL, which was done twice, the conjunctiva is also quite scarred. So you know, you're not going to get a nice... Uh... So we decided the first thing we were going to do was to try and release the peripheral anterior sinecure. So we go ahead and make a paracentesis. As Dr. Bashak was mentioning, if you are starting off, and so it's always helpful to put some ink mark onto your <coughs> side port knife so that maybe when you make your side port, you can easily uh, identify where it is located. I put in some myotic because I want to bring down the pupil and try to see how small the pupil can get. Then I put in some sodium hyaluronate. Try not to get the air bubbles because it tends to obstruct your field of vision using a iris repositor. Now you come back, the sinicolysis that you do, you have to use a kind of a gentle force. And here the pressure point that I'm applying is on the cornea. So basically the, I, I'm not trying to 
put apply too much pressure on the iris but i'm my tip of my instrument is touching the cornea and wherever the iris is adherent i'm trying to press on the cornea and try to see if i can break the adhesion and i think this is somewhere where you need to have some feel you know because beyond a certain point if you persist you are likely to tear the iris from the road and always uh, use uh, uh, like uh, step by step don't try to use a consistent pressure to release all the synechia in one go so i always uh, try to come from either side but i go uh, you know uh, just a small area by area i try to see to it that uh, wherever i can break the synechia i try to just take a break and then try to come back again uh, at it from a different direction and here you can see that by using some pressure gentle pressure we were able to release the synechia in case this doesn't work then you can go back with your micro scissors and you can try and cut the additions on the cornea that is also quite helpful here you can see that we have finally been able to break the synechia as dr basak was mentioning in these kind of synechia which are attached to the prior surgical wound often they can be vitreous so you need to watch out for that as well so if you are sweeping your instrument and you see your iris or the pupil moving then you know that uh, you know there may be some vitreous strands now what i am trying to do is once you release the synechia i am going in with the micro forceps catching the iris and stretching the iris because an iris which has been uh, which has had peripheral synechia for long duration tends to develop some fibrosis on the surface as well so when you stretch the iris you break those fibrous additions and thereby your pupil can uh, you know come down to a normal size otherwise the pupil remains so but remember that here this is something that you need to do by feel you need to know when to stop because if you pull excessively you are more likely to create an iridodialysis so you can see that i am just applying gentle pressure and visualizing at the same time and i have been able to make that pupil a little bit central than what it was originally at the beginning and now i can see that the pupil size has also come down and you can see how soft the eye is so i was planning whether i need to do uh, a little bit of pupiloplasty to bring the pupil size a little smaller now uh, i'm going to go in and put in some more uh, so normally you can do it under cohesive viscoelastic itself but sometimes you can use a hybrid technique that means you already had some viscoelastic into the eye and you put in a air bubble and the air bubble doesn't leak out because the viscoelastic in the periphery prevents that air bubble from going out through the paracentesis you can see that there are multiple previous uh, entry points from the previous surgeries and the decimates will always be more adherent at those points and you can see how fibrotic the decimates is so you really need to uh, and sometimes you can see that uh, there, there i have opened up one of the side ports the inner lip with your reverse sinski you need to watch out for them because otherwise you know because your the reverse sinski tip will get stuck into those inner lips and if you are not very careful you will end up either enlarging it or you create a tear in the stroma so now since i had this and the opposite quadrant i felt that that part of the cornea is untouched i decided to make a 3.2 mm incision that is through which my inserter is going to go in Uh, so i used a 2.8 keratome and i made a 3.2 mm incision uh, uh, entry point and i am placing a suture uh, to close this entry point because i still have some more steps to do before i use this wound and now this decimates which i am uh, have to remove it's quite thick so i go back through my uh, paracentesis wound and i try to break the addition so you can see in the area where i've done the synechialysis the decimates is kind of broken but there are still areas where it is kind of tightly adherent to the inner lip of the wound so you need to have a micro forceps and a micro scissors which are quite useful uh, you can get them from um, some of the indian companies they usually cost between 7 to 8000 for one of them and i like to use the one from mst which is a autoclavable handle and disposable tips which you can eat here and you can use it uh, several times before they stop working they are really nice so i'm trying to go in through this uh, different paracentesis i made one more paracentesis inferiorly to attach my ac maintainer which keeps the chamber form 
and I'm kind of almost done, but there is still some areas where, you know, just at the, en the entry point of the previous surgery, that the decimates is really adherent and not uh, coming out. So at this point, I decide to go in with my micro forceps and see if I can easily peel off. So this is very important. Uh, I've already done my sinuculysis. So this decimates is not attached to the iris. So if I'm pulling, I'm not pulling on the iris. So that's something that you really need to watch out for. If you have a decimate that's still stuck to the iris and you try to do this technique of just pulling it out, you can end up pulling on the iris and end up creating an iridodialysis as well. So here you can see these are the tags which are attached to the inner lip. I try, but it's not coming out, so I grasp it. And then I go in with my micro scissors and I can go in. So these, these micro scissors, micro forceps are from MST and they are quite nice, quite useful. And it's, it's quite good. In India, you can get them from Epsilon. Uh, they, they have them in stock. So you can. So now I'm just testing out my anterior chamber to see whether the air, air bubble is filling the anterior chamber completely or not. And then I realize I've not done my inferior PI. So I go in with my retractor and I can go inferiorly at six o'clock and I put few cuts, like I said, the suction is about 250, cutting rate is about 250, 300. I make the cuts and the flow is close by and I make sure that after every few cuts, I just check it out and I can see that I've made a nice small PI. And then <clears throat> I need to go and prepare my donor. So I'm going to do a air fill and leave it at that. The donor, uh, again, before I prepare my donor again, uh, as what Dr. Basak was doing, I'm just trying to use a uh, sizing, I'm using a, and I put eight millimeter and I realize that there is ample space to fit in an eight millimeter donor. So I've done the dissection pretty much same using the cut in artificial chamber to mark, uh, because I'm going to load it onto a, a, a device similar to a using glide called the Michaeluso inserter. I'm just making this cut from the main incision so that I can reflect this. Yeah. So I mark the Span. And then I create a mark. And then I punch out the eight millimeter. Now here, unlike num what Namrata had shown, you can float the tissue, but in ultra thin, because the tissue does not have rigidity, it is very, very floppy. So one of the things that I can do is I use a trifold technique. That, that means I go with my that's a capsular axis forceps that I'm holding in my hand, which I hold one edge, and I just trifold the technique. There is a little bit of viscoelastic, which is protecting the endothelium, and that's again only in the center. So we don't want the viscoelastic coming out. And it's always important that on the platform you put a little bit of fluid, because if you don't put a put the fluid, it's very difficult to get this uh, thin uh, graft to move to the desired position. So you can see the trifold. So trifolding uh, helps that the tissue does not fold in the reverse direction. And compared to the Busing glide, uh, this one, there is a plunger behind. So it pretty much works like the endoglide. So I use a micro forceps. Again, catching the tip can be a little bit tricky. Uh, you grasp the, make sure that your lower uh, platform goes below the graph, get a good grip, and then bring it to the tip. Before you let go, uh, move, move the tip side by side. And that ensures that your tip is free. And then you come back behind from the plunger and close it. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a closed system. You just dab the excess fluid at the tip. And then to be able to identify the leading edge, you can put a little bit of ink mark on the tip. You can see that. That's a small ink, ink mark. Now you come back to the patient side. Now here, the air bubble, if it is present, it also helps control if there are any bleeding from the iris or anything like that. And it also prevents, keeping an air bubble also prevents any kind of fibrin formation. All the fibrin formation is not that a problem in surgery, but if you're doing a DMEC, uh, if you have fibrin in the anterior chamber, it can be a problem, especially if you have done uh, sinuculysis or if you've done a PI and it, it is bleeding, so you need to watch out for that. So you can see that, and so now I come in, I attach my AC maintainer back into position. I aspirate the air bubble out. You can see there is an air bubble behind the IOL as well. You can see that that's dancing behind. 
So I need to go and remove that as well. So I go with my cannula behind the iris and then I go beyond the eye well and I just aspirate. I know it's a vitrectomized eye. So beyond the eye well, you can easily catch the air bubble and remove it. So now I bring my Michaeluso inserter. My AC maintainer is on at this point of time and I insert the tip into the eye. So you can see that. So now my Michaeluso inserter is blocking the wound and my AC is nice and deep. So I come in with my uh, micro forceps from the opposite side, come into the AC, grasp the donor tissue. The ink mark helps me in that. I pull the donor tissue into the anterior chamber. I don't let go. Remember an ultra thin tissue will not snap open like a regular d tissue. It takes some time. And plus I have put a little bit of viscoelastic. So the two folded portion also remains stuck a little longer. So wait a little while. And once it has opened up, stop the AC maintainer flow. And then you let go of the forceps, remove the AC maintainer. And now I'm going to go with my 30 gauge cannula. I go into the, uh, uh, below the donor lenticule within the folded part and then give a air bubble, uh, inject a mid-size air bubble. And now my this donor disc is secure. Now I can pay attention to my wounds. I come and I secure the main wound. These are all pre-placed sutures, so you don't have to take a bite. Sometimes if you don't put a pre-placed suture, and at this point when you're trying to take a bite, two things can happen. Either while taking the bite, the air tends to leak out. And the second thing is you hit a vessel when you're taking a bite and it tends to bleed. And a lot of times, if, especially if the eye is soft, you can have blood trickling into the anterior chamber, which can again be very difficult because then you have to rush or to wash it out. So always uh, having pre-placed suture, it's uh, always helpful. And in a vitrectomized eye where putting in air is sometimes a little bit tricky, I always find it helpful to close all the paracentesis, especially if you have used the paracentesis for a lot of maneuver, like using it for your stripping of the decimals and if you have passed your micro forceps through it, often the wound will not, and, and you know, hydrating the wounds at this point is also a little bit difficult because you, you cannot control the amount of pressure that you want into the eye. So I always like to close the wound using sutures. Once you have done that, uh, then you can move on to looking at the centration of the graft. We have seen everyone showing the centration by, you know, uh, using strokes on the surface. But in certain cases, if it doesn't work, you can even go in with your reverse sense key, catch hold of one edge of the graft, and then you can bring it back into the desired position. So I'm just trying to form the uh, globe because it's a bit tectomized eye, the eye is going to be soft. And in a soft eye, if you, without forming, if you try to move the graph, uh, you know, sometimes you, your entire graph can fall onto the iris surface or it can, the air can come in front of the graph. So by normalizing the pressure, the eye is a little, you know, firm, it's not absolutely soft. And then you can stroke the surface. There's a small, tiny air bubble in the interface. I was trying to see if I can get it out, but that's fine. That's going to get absorbed pretty fast. Uh, don't try to keep a very large air bubble because that will fixate the graph and you won't be able to move it. Ideally, you should have an air bubble which is either the same size as the graph or slightly smaller. Then you find that it's easier to move the donor tissue to the desired position. If you keep a bubble which is larger than the donor lenticule, then often the air bubble kind of holds the graft in position, fixating it, and it doesn't allow to move. So now the graft is in the desired position. Before I put in my air bubble in a vitrectomized eye, I will always uh, you know, inject fluid to normalize the pressure. And once I have done that, then I can go with my air cannula and I can inject air to form the chamber. So you can see there is still a small air bubble, that's fine. So, and then I am just, because I realized that this was where I put the AC maintenance, so I want to close that as well. And you can see the pupil is kind of almost central, still slightly updrawn, but uh, much better than what we started off with. So 
So that's pretty much the end of surgery. We put in a bandage contact lens at the end of surgery. What Dr. Bassett mentioned was that when you are removing your speculum, be careful because often what happens is at the time of speculum, you can have the air leaking out through your either through your side port or through your main wound. Try to lift up the speculum and then remove it so that there is no pressure on the blow. And before you patch your eye, please check the pressure. In case you feel that the, uh, the pressure is low, you can always go back and inject a little bit more air. This is on day one. You can see there is 80% fill. There is a meniscus of fluid behind. And this is on day three. You can see now we have like a 50% fill. The cornea is already becoming quite clear. You can see the iris details. And at this point of time, the patient returned back to the referring doctor. And maybe when the patient comes back a month later, maybe I'll share it on the uh, our mailing group and show you what So, yes, any questions are welcome. You will be. I have a couple of questions, sir. So, you sure. left air uh, in when you were dissecting the graft and you said that would help with fibrin formation. Does it also help in uh, sort of making the cornea stay clear rather than leave fluid inside the eye while you're dissecting the graft? Yes, sometimes if you leave a complete air fill because the cornea dehydrates, you can have a cornea looking a little bit more clearer. But the best part is that if you have any bleeding from the iris, it can arrest that bleeding. And because it's and, and uh, also because it's occupying that space, uh, the chances of fibrin formation are also less. But before you put in your graph, always go in with your Simcoe and give it a, a quick wash so that if anything is there, you can wash it out. If there are blood clots from a bleeding point, sometimes it's best not to try and at the point of bleeding, try not to disturb the clot because if you disturb the clot, it will mm -hmm. start bleeding again. But rest of the area where, where you feel that there was no bleeding, but it's just the blood lying around, that part you can go and aspirate the blood fragments. Yes. I think it was a very, I mean, especially if it's a post RD surgery and post vitrectomized eyes, and it was a difficult case to do. And because you are on the other side, I mean, everything is so hypotenuse. Correct. And where the it, chances of graft detachments are the highest. Where, the, you know, the, the, the tendency in these eyes is that knowing how much of air to inject, because what will happen is if you overfill with air beyond a certain point, the air will slip behind the eye well, you know, it will just uh, go between the iris and the lens and it will just go behind. And then you will find that, uh, that once the air goes posteriorly, then more air you inject, the more post uh, it keeps going. So in that kind of scenario, if you see air that has gone behind, you have to first aspirate the air from the anterior chamber, try to get the air out from behind the IOL, again, inject fluid to normalize. And then, so you do a graded air injection. You don't do a air fill in one go. You first put a mid-size air bubble to support your graft. Then you normalize the pressure, close your wounds so that the pressure, the fluid pressure can be maintained. And then you go in, enlarge the bubble just to get an air fill that is sufficient to fill the chamber. Not like your tight air fill, what you see used to doing because the moment you try to make it tight, the air is going to go behind. Rajesh, can you tell us uh, what was the position? I mean, in, uh, in video, we were a little confused. Which I, was, was I, was, I was sitting at 12 o'clock position. And do My I main wound was temporal between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock. Yeah. And your left you put from That was temporal. The, uh, the tissue you put was inferior temporally? Yeah, inferotemporally. I put the tissue in from inferotemporally. Yes. Okay. And this was the left eye of the patient. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, because that was the quadrant which did not, the cornea looked relatively normal. Um, Basically, yeah. there was a lot of dense stromal vascularization. So you can't, I did not make a paracentesis there, neither because there, if the moment you do, it will start to bleed. Yeah, and the blood uh, and blood in, a, in a eye which is soft, sometimes the blood instead of coming out will start trickling into the anterior chamber, it can go through the pupil, then it will start going into the vitreous, so you don't want to do that. And I guess that was the point you were making when Dr. Basak was talking yeah. about, you were talking about the wound part. So here, yeah. for that the reason, you, you don't know what exactly. In place. Yeah, yeah. So it, it can basically complicate your surgery. Uh, sometimes, yes, we get away because we, we are used to doing surgery from a particular seating position. We are more comfortable in a particular quadrant. So, you know, so for me, normally when I do my dissect, uh, being a right-handed person, I always try to make my wound, uh, you know, kind of superonasally. That's somewhere between 
11 o'clock and 12:30 that's the yeah. area right hand so that's very easy and so oh. but you, but i i i think you can either sit superiorly or you can sit temporarily the disadvantage of sitting temporarily is that you don't have place to rest your hand mm. advantage of sitting, not the left eye yes and the advantage of sitting temporarily is that you have a wider field to work yeah. with you don't have the brow that's kind of making it difficult you can insert your instruments in a much more horizontal plane as uh, sitting superiorly when your globe tends to turn uh, lower so these are things when i started doing dilek when i learned from mark terry i used to always sit temporal and always my all my initially surgeries were all uh, right. temporal incision and even if i had to do a faco i would do a faco superiorly like close that and then come back temporal and do my uh, dilek uh, temporally so there was this question i think that if you have to and i also showed supro uh, i also go a little supro nasal because i find intro temporal pulling a lot easier so the question was that if you have to do a dissect triple would you still do it that way or would you do it from a temporal incision no depends on the case to case basis now when we do a dissect triple we are always trying to do it through one wound yeah but, so uh, Yeah, shift so yourself temporal and do both of them together. Correct, but in case you are so used to doing your cataract surgery seated superiorly, that temporarily you may find it challenging in yeah. a eye in a cornea which is not clear because you don't want to introduce one more factor which can affect your surgical this thing. Then you can sit superiorly do your cataract surgery because that's what your mental mind frame is, and then come back temporarily and you can do your dissect. So that's perfectly fine, I guess. So uh, I have a think part is. observation in sfiol that you must recognize the blue haptic yes whenever you choose the site or particularly in, in this type of cases or multiple surgeries has been done so you might damage the proline haptic so absolutely absolutely if you are doing sinusculosis also sometimes okay. not only proline haptics previously people have been doing surgery using sutures so you know sometimes peripherally when they are passing sutures that sinicke point may be because of the suture that has accidentally gone through the iris and so right, right. you have to be careful so when you are doing that uh, area of sinicularity and you see your lens moving be very careful because you might end up breaking a you know suture and then your iol can then start tilting and also with one blue iol i had where the moment i deepened my chamber the iol kind of the the haptic slid into the eye and the i so we have to exchange the iol in that case because unlike the flange iol where the where there is a flange that's holding it this mm -hmm. some of the glued iols people are just pulling out the haptic and leaving it like that the fibrin glue does not really uh, hold the lens so if you are applying too much of pressure sometimes the iol can shift from its position so one important point is that in any case pre op dilatation is the visibility is somehow you are getting some visibility pre op dilatation is a must to check what is the lens position and lens status particularly if ear capsulotomy done earlier and sulcus fixation lens and you are not sure what about you have not dilated the pupil during air bubble injection i had two incidents so i had i will dropped into the vitreous so i finished the surgery and later on my vr colleague actually managed that drop tile so sir i debride i i debride the epithelium in the opd for cases which are complex yeah. and i i just put in some anesthetic i do a epithelial debridement so that i can see better and then i put a bandage contact lens so what happens is sometimes i can also see the optic disc after i remove that so i know the optic nerve status because a lot of these patients also have secondary glaucoma so if i see like a glaucomatous optic atrophy sometimes i don't advise them to have surgery even, at all you can even get a macular oct done after debriding the epithelium yes, so oh, yes, absolutely that is also I, something i, I think the existing should do that if you feel that you can remove the epithelium they put a bandage contact lens and then evaluate the anterior segment maybe take a look at the fundus if possible and then you can plan your surgery much better because you know intraoperatively also when you remove the epithelium very interesting i never thought this uh, 
Yeah, yeah. This no, no, I, I always do that. Sometimes so, it is very yeah. useful. Very yeah, useful. Yeah, divide epithelium and do a macular rosity because you don't know oh, what recently, is recently I had I had a one-eyed patient who was referred who had a history of glaucoma, glaucoma surgery, and the patient the attendant came, they were very desperate, they wanted surgery, everything. And I explained to them that I'll remove the epithelium. So I removed the epithelium and he had an absolute GOA. Oh. So after which I said, nothing doing. We cannot, because patients have hopes, you know, we do the surgery and then if you don't get them vision, sometimes they get very disappointed. So why unnecessarily putting through another surgery? Also, some, sometimes when you have like awkward position, uh, like uh, very prominent nose, and you find uh, your second instrument, like pull-in technique, if you're using second instrument is very awkward. In fact, easier way out is to change. Uh, it's easy to put a donor tissue there rather than putting a long... Having said that, uh, a couple of times I've done my uh, desec surgery using the macular so inserter, but my nurse was not able to get the micro forceps on time. So I've just <laughs> taken a needle, I've bent the needle up and I've gone into the side port using the bent needle, I've caught the and I've brought the tissue back in. Just that before you let go, you have to first move your needle tip down and then you have to disengage. Otherwise, your the, the tip will not Come let out, you know, I think yeah. you keep twisting your, you know, and pronate yeah. it. Okay. Pronation and supination, both are important. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now we can go to the next speaker because our uh, EC meeting is also there. Correct. So we have another 10 minutes. So if there are any questions that are there, we, we feel that we can answer. So I think we have we have had a wonderful session. I would say that we have shown so many, yeah, quite, so many quite different kind of videos uh, from Dr. Basak, from Namrata, and I have shown one. And the best part I felt was that maybe because we showed a relatively unedited. I think it was uh, a really nice. Yeah, and, you know, we were I, I was yeah. absolutely caught unawares, Rajesh. I had to you know take out the <laughs> unedited ones so we can do something about but it's, it. But it's really nice because at, at the end of it, at least you also feel that you have made some meaningful presentation and you yeah. know, which will at least benefit people who are doing it. And people have seen you do it live. You know, next time somebody asks me, how do you inject air in a vitrectomized eye when you are doing dissect? So there is, I've shown you, like this is a case where I've done, right. it, I've done it. So Rama next, the, call the next speaker. Uh, so the next we have uh, Dr. Soham Basak, who's going to show us a special, again, a special situation. He has done DSEC in a, a large pupil with aphakia. Uh, Dr. Soham? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So thank you, Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Geeta for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak in this session. So I'll be talking about uh, uh, a novel technique of air-assisted donor lenticular insertion in a special situation of aphakia with uh, large iris defects. So as we know, the challenge in aphakia is basically to get that air tamponade and uh, lenticular ad addition. So what is novel in this technique is air is used to maintain AC in all the key steps. There is no intracameral use of any OVD. And the main steps here is a very large but well-constructed tunnel. Desmond stripping is done under air bubble. Then the donor lenticle is done while there is an air bubble in the AC. And I'm using a needle push-through technique, either a 26 or a 30 gauge. There is minimal donor manipulation. And usually, I don't do any fluid air management at the end of the surgery. So this is one case of a one-eyed lady. Again, absolutely no visibility. Prior records show that she has undergone a cataract surgery, but we do not know what. UBM showed that there is absolutely no superior iris here and aphakia with no posterior capsular support. Ideally, as we were discussing, we would do a two-stage procedure where you would first remove the hypertrophic epithelium and see what's underneath and then go for a second surgery, if at all possible. But again, this lady was traveling from a far distance. And so we decided to do it in a single setting. So this is the epithelium being removed. So the, it is vascularized, unfortunately, and there is bleeding. And as Dr. Rajesh was saying, it is 
of course, better to stop just short of the limbus. And sometimes using a, just your peritomy scissors to just cut it is always better. So it uh, prevents unnecessary bleeding. Once we have view of it, so next comes the tunnel making. So I believe we are all good SICS surgeons. And look at this, the incision is quite big. It is almost six and a half to seven millimeters. That is very important in doing this air assisted technique. I've already formed the AC with air, ensured <clears> that there is no vitreous in the AC, made two side ports. And now I'm making the tunnel. So the size is important. So this is bigger than what I would do for a usual needle push through technique. And then finally is the step of doing desmet stripping under air. The biggest advantage of doing it under air is you have this sort of uh, total internal reflection. So you can identify all the small uh, DM endothelium tags that are there. Occasionally you might have these uh, bubbles escaping from the side. So you'll have to top up with air intermittently. Use both the side ports. And look at this reflex that you will see. Because once you're peeling the desmet membrane, the edge is very well identified. It gives off a very prominent edge is identified. That's just because of the fluid air interface that is going on there. And here we encounter a very thick desmet scar and some retrocondyl membrane. I was unable to remove it completely with the reverse Sinsky. So I have gone in with a reverse uterata forceps and just grasped it and peeled it off. So every, all of these steps are done while maintaining the anterior chamber with air. And finally, the needle push through technique. So coat the incision and posterior to it nicely with the heel on. And then the tissue is kept on top of the cornea. I also prefer staining it, uh, giving it an S stamp just to make sure because most of the times these corneas are very hazy. And this just ensures that you are having the correct orientation of the graft. And if you notice the graft is a little bit on the thicker side, maybe I would say more than 150 microns. So it is not folding on itself quite easily. And you just place it onto the conjunctiva and go in with a 26 gauge needle. Just slide it slowly over the air bubble. That part is very important. So the tunnel making is very important here. The large tunnel should allow the graft to go in without much unfolding. And then you just go in smoothly and the air bubble does not usually escape if you have made the tunnel properly. And finally, I have closed all the main and the side ports with sutures and I'm making just two venting incisions in this case because the you expect some amount of air. I have not done uh, fluid milking also in this case. And this is at one day post-op and finally at one month. And then unfortunately, this lady has not come back for follow-up. And this is the second case. This is a young gentleman. Again, one-eyed has undergone a VR intervention for a coloboma where they have done lensectomy also. You can see the BSK formation. So I'll start off directly with the desmet stripping under air bubble. Again, you can see this very nice shining reflex as the desmet is stripped off. And in these, if you're planning something like this, make your side ports very small, maybe go in half the length of the side port blade. 
so that even when you are manipulating with these instruments there is minimal or no leak of any air from the from the ports so this globe has little bit more hypotony because it has undergone prior past when a vitrectomy and here ideally if possible it is better to always remove the desmond membrane out because i shall show you why because you can have something like this while making the incision i accidentally moved it and it dropped fortunately dropped on the iris and it did not drop into the vitreous cavity so later on i had to go in again and retrieve it out so there is the stripped desmond membrane which has come out and again the donor insertion so just coat the posterior part and part of your drape also this is a little smaller graft this is a 6 and a half millimeter graft because he has a small cornea the tunnel length again in this case is about 5 millimeters so when you are sliding it in there is very less chance of the graft getting folded again a little bit graft is little bit on the thicker side so maybe around 150 to 180 microns just place the graft on the layer of painting go in with the needle just once you are in just glide it over the air make sure your needle is touching the stroma at all points and that's it and again i have sutured all the main and the side ports and you can see the good golden ring of a uh, air fill and in this case since the iris defect is inferiorly there is no need of doing any air fluid exchange just do some burping of air like you do in a cubic surgery Happy with the operation? You can complete the surgery. Then there is no need to remove the rest of the air. So this is the post-op of this gentleman. This is at day one, and finally at six months. And this is the corresponding OCT, uh, AS OCT images. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor Soham. That was a very yeah. Yeah. Uh, excellent case. Very difficult to tough cases for a young age of so humble. <laughs> Thank you, madam. I have it's a question. Uh, so, is it as easy as it looks to put it over the air bubble, uh, the graft, or uh, or um, uh, to phrase it a little differently? Um, having a thicker graft does it help you in these cases? So having a thicker graft helps me so that it doesn't fold on itself when it's going in. So putting it over the air bubble that is being done with the needle. So you have to point your needle upwards a bit, and once your so your needle sort of uh, make you make sure that the needle touches the host stroma the entire time. So you're right. uh, uh, making that you making scratch the, the stroma on, all the way in. Scratch all the way in. but the thicker part if you have a thinner graft then it has a tendency for it to fold inwards and that once it happens then again you would have to inject uh, a little bit of fluid and sort of do like what you would do in a taco technique what is your immediate post op management how do you keep the air in the anterior chamber so i keep the, the patient kind of large yeah yeah i keep the patient lying down on the ot table or in the recovery room for at least an hour 
and then I would just do a little bit air burp, make sure that the IOP is on the lower side. And then uh, I keep the patient, now I'm not keeping overnight, but uh, previously I would keep the patient overnight also. Because uh, I've, I've seen some surgeons recommend, especially in eyes which are aphagic and they have a large sector iridectomy, to prevent the donor disc from dislocating into the vitreous cavity. Because sometimes intraoperatively, you may be able to position it. But right. postoperatively, if your patient forgets to wear the eye shield at night or accidentally rubs the eye, yes. you can have a disc. So sometimes they put a full thickness suture at one edge. It's kind of a protective suture just to secure the graft so that in the rare event, if the disc does not attach and you have to do a rebubbling, at least it's attached at one point and you don't have to rush to your retinal colleague. And once the disc has attached well in the post-operative period, you can go and cut the suture and just pull it out. So, you know, this is again something that can be considered as an additional step in the sense that once you have put in your graft, you put in a complete air fill, then maybe go in with the needle full thickness and catch one edge of the donor as well and bring it out. That is one option. Or the second option is to place pre-place a suture in the donor. So it's like a suture pull through. So, you know, mm -hmm. your one edge, you already have the suture and your needle comes out through the cornea. And then when you're pulling it out, it brings the disc in and then you can tie the knot onto the corneal surface and then later on remove it. But overall, it's very nice. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a learning curve to it because it depends on a proper wound construction. Otherwise, the air will tend to come out quite easily. So, but yes. yeah, the the simply doesn't move, so I'm sure there is. Uh, so I also had a question. So in a aphakic uh, eye with such a large pupil, would a pull through be a little more easier in the sense that at least you can hold on to the disc and ensure that it doesn't fall until you have uh, an air fill underneath like a push through seems a little more challenging what do you feel Dr. So, I have not tried a pull through but uh, I have tried using a scaffold using a sheet slide underneath so that also would prevent the disc from the, uh, falling downwards people have tried gone in with a BCL also mm. so that, that the falling down of the graft, losing the graft posterior is probably the worst thing that can happen. You can you can use a, you can create a mesh with a proline suture in an aphakic eye, especially in the quadrant where you don't have the iris tissue. You can just pass proline suture from limbus to limbus, bring it out a few times. So it kind of creates a crisscross so that, and once your disc is in place and everything fine, then you can just pull the suture out. So that kind of also gives you a protection where you can prevent this yeah, I think they've done it for silicon oil filled eyes to keep the silicon yeah. oil behind the. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And it also the air will stay in the front. There's one question generally for the panel. So, in a failed PK, uh, what would be a procedure of choice between DSEC and DMEC? And when else would you use a non stripping DSEC? Non stripping DSEC, I think you would do it for failed PKs. You can do it for CAGDs, non-stripping uh, DSEC. And if you can do a good DMEC, then for failed PK, you can do a DMEC. If you're not very confident about it, then of course you can do a DSEC. Ma'am, how would you size these uh, grafts, re-grafts over a PK? Uh, would you make them smaller than the original graft? Sometimes we don't have enough information. Would you go by what size you find on, on the table or... Uh, so if you are able to get the previous records, I, the best. I can answer that. I what I. Oh okay. Yes. Go ahead, Doctor Basaki. Yes, sir. So, uh, please go ahead. So. So you can do anterior segment AOC, SOCT to see the posterior edge of the PK graph. Sometimes there are ledges and different size. So you can actually measure from the anterior segment AO, yeah. SOCT. If the previous graph size say in a keratoconus patient, larger graph size, then you can choose a lower, smaller graph. But if the previous graph is like 6.5, 7 millimeter, then of course, you see that from limbus to what is the host drop junction area. So idea is not just overlap 
too little on the graft host junction. It should overlap more, at least one millimeter for all around, or it should be within the graft. Hmm. At the edge, there is a tendency to fluid going on, especially on day two or day three, half chamber fluid. That time fluid may go inside and sometimes there are little uh, hypotony and capillary actions of fluid and donor detachment actually higher in case of post PK cases. But this is what I am telling that graph size. For right. DMA, I think anything because it will go like this and uh, it can take the shape of the posterior mm. edges. Right. So I have we have one more question. This is an interesting scenario, so I wanted to uh, post this. <laughs> In case you have a situation where after the surgery, your air goes behind, like you have a large PI or you have an iris defect, if the air completely goes behind, it can push the iris completely and create a 360 degree pass. In that scenario, if you see that on day one, we had a case that we wanted to share, but because of lack of time, I'm just going ahead with the scenario. Uh, so if you have a 360 degree pass like that, would you intervene? Would you wait? What would you do on like day one of the post-op? You have, to, you have to intervene uh, immediately because this pass will be permanent. So you have to actually, simple thing, here the jobs are, here graft is attached. So basically you have to down the iris. So what you do to do under block, perivalvar block, because topically it will be highly painful. It will, you just take as iris spatula, where your, this from the graft, edge and the limbus where the area is much more wider, choose that area. Maybe you can create a separate opening or the previous opening and you just tap over the iris gently and the air bubble will be coming forward. And then you can take out much more air because now graft is well at us. After one day, usually graft at us in most of the cases. This is my view. I, what happened earlier, I used to do that. Yes. So if I have this situation and if the eye is pseudo fake, I will not hesitate to take a syringe with a needle and pass it through the limbus or through the peripheral clear cornea, go through the iris, go behind the iris. You're not likely to damage anything because it's a pseudo fake eye. You just go and aspirate the air and you can, you know, so sometimes you just aspirate the air and then make the patient lie down flat and often the aqueous forms and you find that in half an hour, you have the iris that's already, because if you have removed the air that's pushing the iris forward, you will find that the iris is already falling down. And if it does not, then you can try this maneuver of going and trying to physically separate the iris. And, but it's important to release. Otherwise, once the sinechia forms, then it's going to, in the long term, your graft is not going to survive very long. I think we have something else which is scheduled, so I think we can wind up. Huh? Thank you so much, uh, everyone. I'm sorry Thank if you. all the questions were not able, you know, we could not yeah. ask the questions. We had quite a large number of questions. Uh, so, uh, you could email Ramya, we could answer them on our emails. If you could just copy paste them on an email and email to all three of us, we will answer them. We could do. Uh, thank you. The, the presentations were detailed. It was step by step, and this was an amazing uh, session. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. And uh, Thank you. I think we'll uh, uh, we'll let you get back to uh, another session. So if you're done, I would just like yeah. to conclude with a few concluding remarks. Uh, yeah. That I guess this is the charm of Kera Connect. That you know you have the best of masters, with the added bonus of them being in an absolutely relaxed and informal session where you get to clear all your doubts. And in Dr. Namrata's words, I think I could call this a halwa session. You know. <laughs> 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 which was the uh, benefit not just to you know, aspiring and novice surgeons, but for um, everyone across the entire spectrum of expertise. And uh, very well done, both Ramya and uh, Devyani, for uh, compiling and conducting it in, in, at such a short notice and doing such a good job of it. A very special thanks to Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Basak, Dr. Namrita, for your excellent videos and for you know mentoring this entire session. Thank you so much. And uh, our next Kera Connect will be on the topic of keratoconus in early September. The dates will be announced uh, soon. And uh, with this, we come to the end of this uh, Kera Connect. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to all the members for you know staying 
everybody till the end of the session i think it was the interest portion that kept everyone here so thanks to everybody and we meet again next month thank you thank you ma'am thank you, thank you are we live yes doctor we are live we are just waiting the attendant attendees to leave okay attendees to leave so all the moderator and uh, the other speaker also except the ec member will be staying here no? yeah. hmm. padas how are you padas I'm absolutely fine, Dr. Masak. Oh, great to see you. Great, Stay great. here. Good to see everyone here. Yeah, after a long time, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to meet physically now. It's been high time. <laughs> you come to DOS for oh, 2nd, 3rd October. <laughs> <laughs> you are invited. We'll yeah. hold a Konya Society of India session. Geeta, what do you say? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, I did receive a mail. I mean, you get to I sent a mail. I said this would be one way of getting everybody together. Sounds interesting. I am surprised. surprised. I don't know what will happen to the third wave, but I'm really surprised that people have so many people have said yes. They are going to. They are willing to travel. Of course, it might change. I really don't know, but you know, uh, everybody has got bored. It's uh, desperate now. Yeah, we have two of our EC members who are. On the flight, off the flight, so because everybody is back on the flight. And who else is on the flight? Vikas. Pratin said he is on the flight. So everybody is eager to get on the flight. <laughs> I've been, we have been missing for a long time, so it's like a major event. Ah, I'm flying, I'm flying. <laughs> <laughs> what is Kuresh? Kuresh is flying. He is on the flight. He is. He is uh, landed. I. A message that we are starting, so I think he should be there. Yeah, I think I think uh, now now we are all by ourselves, so we can go ahead. Do we wait for Dr. Maskati to join, or shall I start? Praveen is not Who's there. there? Who's there? Vikas is there. No, Vikas, no. I haven't Vikas seen. Vikas is not joining today. No, he yeah, said Vikas, he's Vikas, Vikas is not joining. No, no, Vikas is not joining. So we have. Praveen is also not there. Praveen will be joining by nine forty-five because he's also on a flight. So, Shavina, there is one more attendee still. There. Um, Suchi Smita is still there. No, doctor, removed. Okay, sure. Showing them. Okay. It is still so showing, but yeah. Uh, so you'll join now, sir? Sonam Yang is also there. Live stream off, Chip. Live stream is off? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is off. Ajah, just. Uh... It's, uh, it's showing it on. Let's say, on. YouTube, YouTube.